Good day everyone, this is me again, Jomar, and I am here to give my take regarding the new topic, the new task given to us by our professor in Mindanao history subject. Okay, so just a recap. In our previous lessons, we were challenged by our professor to explore more about the sectors in our society, particularly those sectors that are victims or uh, challenge the I mean that those are those sectors that are facing the challenges of prejudices, discrimination, stereotyping, and many others that uh, of course allows us to uh, to share our experiences and suggest ways on how to handle prejudices and discrimination in daily life in a non-violent way to avoid conflict. Right? Okay. And also, just in our previous lesson, we were also challenged to trace the roots of the Bangsamoro struggle, which have been uh, the major cause of displacement of hundreds and thousands of inhabitants, particularly um, in central Mindanao and other parts of the larger region. And this day, I will be focusing on the indigenous peoples of Mindanao, or mean indigenous peoples here in Mindanao, and uh, their how they survive. All right, so I will transfer now into a PowerPoint presentation. Okay. We all know that Mindanao is not only a home of the Muslims, but also of many Christians and indigenous peoples, or the Lumad which has no single tribe, which refers also to all ethnic tribes and other people who are not Christianized nor Islamized. That means we can refer all indigenous peoples before the coming of Spaniards and Islamic religion as Luman. Mindanao has 18 IPs. And this includes the Ata, the Bagobo, the Banuaon, the Blaan, the Bukitnon, the Dibabawon, Galdon, Kalagan, Amanwa, Mandaya, Manguangan, Manobo, Mansaka, Sabaden, Tayakaulo, Tiboli, Tidurai, and Ubo. And many of these are found in the Davao region. In fact, the region is publicized to have the greatest number of indigenous uh, tribal communities living within its territory. And this includes the Bagobo tribe. The Bagobo tribe are farmers found along the slopes of the Mount Up. They are known for their colorful hand-woven avaca garments and dress, embroidered or geometric patterns, along with beads, shells, and metal discs. We also have the Ubo and Gingans are forest, they are like Bagobo, they are forest dwellers. The Mansaka and Mandaya are the more musically inclined among the tribes, also known as skilled silversmiths. They inhabit the eastern areas of the Val del Norte and the remote mountain clearings of the Val Oriental, where the Mandaya are practicing Kaingen farming. In the western part of the Val del Norte, there we can find at a tribe which are closely related to the Manovos or they are also known as the River Dwellers. The Kalagans are known to be found at the shores of the Vogue. In Compostela Valley, uh, though the one spoken language is Cebuano, there live the Atatalaingot, the Babawon, Manguangan, Mantaya, and Mansaka as the dominant groups. However, many members of these tribes did not remain in their areas. Some of them are now widely scattered all throughout the Davao region and other provinces including Sarangani, South Cotabato, Cotabato, and other neighboring provinces. Now, let's move forward to the history of the indigenous peoples. The history tells us that prior to the coming of the Islamic religion and Christianity, the culture of the indigenous peoples was already established 
and uh, we already had a society and institutions patterned on our own culture. In fact, um, we already had a contact and established relationship with Chinese traders as early as uh, 13, 17. Okay, and this can actually be found in a, chi in a Chinese article authored by Chao Jukwa. And uh, there he described that our uh, natives were honest, gentle, and uh, even industrious. However, um, is it enough to prove that our ancestors were not really barbarians and that they possess an advanced culture in contrast to what Spaniards told us? Well, you will know the answer later after my presentation. Um, this time, I will be discussing the four interesting topics to understand more the life of the indigenous peoples and how they survived even before the coming of Islamic religion and Christianity. To wit, we have number one, traditional socio-political organization. Number two, leadership and governance. Number three, land holding practices. And number four, the conflict and conflict resolutions. I am back. All right. So, to answer that question, um, of course, from our subject in Philippine history, we learned that our pre colonial ancestors comprised of uh, fragmented, that means separated and autonomous barangays. But uh, despite of having different names for uh, traditional social political organizations, the features are basically the same. Okay? And if we are going to compare our uh, civilization, I mean our Baranganic system before, uh, to the great ancient civilizations, our Barangays before were uh, really small, relatively. And uh, however, I mean, even so, um, the Barangay had the recognized elements of the state, which uh, in fact, in our constitution nowadays, it is there. Okay, what are those elements? Of course, uh, they had the territory, they had uh, the people, they had the the government, and uh, administrative control or sovereignty over group life. Yeah, yeah, group life. Yeah, and um, it had the government. I mean. Uh, it had a government that uh, revolved from the authority and administrative leadership of this what we call oh datu yeah okay it was uh, and this datu was actually assist assisted by by, the, by a council of elders composed of uh, representatives from different kinds of kin groups living within the territory um generally speaking the social class or the social stratification system we have we had before could be drawn into three classes okay though uh, we have different names but can be drawn into three classes such as the datu okay datu including his uh, family of course the free men which includes the warriors the uh, merchants, the uh, peasants, and even the artisans. Okay, and the thirdly, the uh, the, the dependents are composed mainly of the death peons and uh, the prisoners of war. Okay, now the the social stratification system in the barangay before was not rigid like uh, the stratification in India, the caste system in India. Okay, for instance, uh, we all know that Datu is a powerful title, right? And uh, Datu was always encouraged to uh, to marry a member of the nobility. Of course, that is to maintain the power of their name, right? Because if you're a Datu, that means your family is also is also part of that nobility. However, the Datu has the, has the freedom 
uh, to to marry any person outside his nobility okay he can uh, marry a woman belonging to another class he can actually marry a woman like uh, in the in the those women uh, not women woman part of the dependents uh, or the that peons and uh, the uh, as I mentioned a while ago prisoners of war okay so therefore uh, the Burgundic society that we have before were we could say more democratic compared to the societies of the medieval Europe and uh, ancient India where uh, the their stratification was really rigid do you agree with me yeah because the the dato even has the freedom and there it's they they don't they don't do that they don't do that there okay and uh, to illustrate further the social mobility of the barangay uh the the past and the present political system in some tribes just like the higaunon the dato is recognized in the community of course not, not because of uh, his bloodline but uh, because of the people's choice and decision the same as in the subanon i mean subanon who gives anyone the opportunity to become timuai or also known as the chieftain uh, as long as he is powerful enough to protect the neighbors he can be their uh, uh, their their timuai or their, their, their chieftain so that's how uh, the traditional social political organization of the natives look like before or prior to the coming of the Islam and even Christians in uh, Mindanao. Okay, so to answer that question, uh, allow me to ask you one question if if you were living before with the kind of quality that you have today do you think you are qualified to be a datu or a chieftain we don't know right uh, well the, the the traditional concept of leadership among lumads is still uh, actually evident today with the title datu chieftain may vary from one ethnic group to another and the requirements or the characteristics and qualities of the tribe leader more or less are the same so what are those characteristics generally the datu and chieftain earns the respect of the community usually because of their number one bravery number two generosity number three wisdom depending on the number of people families and villages he has protected and helped now among the higaunon okay these are the people uh, i mean among the higaunon people living within the datos territory of influence or they call it gao or under his leadership are called his sako right sako uh, somehow a, a, a Visayan term, I guess. Customarily, uh, the dato is not dictatorial as he has to consult the council of elders. So it, it so that means if your quality or your, your character that you have today is somehow dictatorial, mm, you cannot be qualified for the position of being a to be a dato or a chieftain. <laughs> okay, so um, those who compose the Council of Elders are usually, mm, I mean, uh, the, the headmen of the families and clans who serve as representatives of the people in the Gao or in the territories, territorial influence of the Datu. This means that uh, even before the Renaissance period in, uh, in uh, Europe, Lumads had been uh, observing democracy and the governance. Under the uh, traditional setup, governance is, I mean, 
was in the hands of many and not monopolized by the dato because the dato has to consult the council of elders in almost all matters uh, re requiring decision that affect the whole community. In Magobo, I mean Magobo, no, in Manobo, uh, becoming a dato, or they call it Igba, Ig Igbuhag, means becoming selfless, okay? Becoming selfless. The leader should think of his people first before himself. He should first uh, know the problems of his constituents and help them in their needs. So there, the generosity comes in. Also, he must ensure that his people live harmoniously and must encourage peaceful living with neighboring countries. And that's where uh, bravery comes in as well. In Bansakas, uh, they, they expect the, the Datu, they call it Matikadong, Matikadong, yeah, to be equipped with leadership skills like bravery, thorough knowledge of the tribe's customary laws, um, wisdom, and articulateness. He must also be fair, alright, morally upright, and financially capable as he would need his wealth. Um, to appease disgruntled parties during conflict mediation and resolving feuds. So if the 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 uh, the the other party cannot pay, the the moral damage the data would be the one to pay for it, and in return, of course, in the con in the condition that party where uh, he uh, he let his wealth uh, be taken away by the other parties of course the party will serve him depending on the amount or the, the wealth give up by the datu gives up by the datu okay so um that's in mansaka in the for the subanan they call it timuai or their, their chieftain a datu must uh, possess not only fighting skill and financial capability more importantly, he must be reliable, okay? Emotionally mature. Um, okay, in that in that part, emotionally mature, I might not be. Uh, I might be. I might not be a qualified chieftain for Sabanon because sometimes my emotion, my emotions are not really mature, just like what I'm doing now in this video. I'm so sorry for that. Okay. Uh, it's also that uh, dato must be industrious, fair, or just like what, what Mansaka, uh, responsible and a good example in the community. And of course, since as he is a good example in the community, he must not be a drunkard, okay, uh, a coward, a thief, or a tyrant, okay, and because he should be living. A life a principled life wise and the uh, good implementer of the laws of his tribe just like other tribes like the Higaunon also they consider integrity and uh, sincerity as important qualities that a Datu must possess but apart from these qualities the Datu must also be uh, someone who knows how to recite the origin stories of their Hidalgo people because if how can you do how can you de de defend I mean defend how can you protect how can you make wise decisions if you don't know the original stories of your people right because you know the the, the, the value of life the culture of people uh, I mean the history of these people can also be reflected to their culture right Yes, I hope you are agreeing with me. Also, he must be familiar with the, uh, the they call it Talawagon. Okay, Talawagon are the spirits commonly invoked uh, during their rituals. Okay, actually, there's one Higaunon who expresses his view regarding uh, the, 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 the system, the political system we have. I mean, the, the, the justice we have in, uh, in our... 
uh, I mean at the at present okay he said that uh, he said that in the lowland the one who settles the conflict would be the one paid the lawyer who resolves the problem would be compensated in them in the mountains he said that the datu would shoulder all the expenses so look if you're going to uh examine or analyze the way they live it's really unique right <laughs> our lawyers here in our country cannot even uh well of course we have the public attorney's office but they are paid by the government but there the datu would shoulder all the expenses um as i've mentioned of course there's a condition right At, at present, we resolve conflict by bringing the case to the court, right? But uh, our uh, unique, I mean, but our pre-Islamic natives has, I mean, had a unique way in resolving conflict. Um, well, the, the, the pre-Islamic life of our natives was no absolute peace peaceful i mean and it it is really groundless to say that uh, the life of our natives had an absolute peace one cannot deny that uh, the violent rido which can also be uh, called by pangayaw and many other names uh, were parts i mean were parts of the philippine native cultural institutions but and this one could actually disrupt or destroy the tranquility of their community. In uh, in modern Western system, in every case, uh, one party loses while another wins. Also, the relationship between the complainants and the accused are not restored. The losers may weep and hold grudges while the winners may celebrate. But in the indigenous system, every avenue is optimally explored, not just to resolve the conflict, but also to ensure the reconciliation between the conflicting parties. Though punishment is inevitable, the ultimate goal of their conflict resolution, or the process of their conflict resolution, is reconciliation. Another unique aspect of indigenous conflict resolution is that the Datu does not only render judgment. Uh, in fact, it is the guidance of the of the elders and the consensus of the community that matters most uh, in the this, in making the decision process. Through this method, the check and balance is ensured so that. The datu is uh, will be prevented from becoming a tyrant or a dictator, all right. And as a symbol of unity and of the community, he must be uh, consultative always, especially with the elders, and um, must uphold the cons the community consensus, especially. Not especially, but in all crucial decisions. Um, this is part of customary law already, and the Datu must follow this procedure, or else he will earn the wrath of Almighty. Which could also mean that, I mean, which could also mean the downfall of his title as a community leader. In many Luman, I mean, in many uh, tribes, Datu and respected members of the Council of Elders are also act as a mediator. They do not only facilitate communication and negotiations, but also they assume the responsibility for raising the required blood money, and they call it Mangan. The mediators may actually include the uh, 
respectable relatives of the conflicting parties, both parties. There must be representatives from the both. The tribal leaders as well, and even the uh, the women with influence in the area. So that means women had a power before to be an influence in their community. Um, when it comes to decision, the decision is the decision of the case would depend on the nature and gravity of the offense. If the offense is minor, it could be settled through payment, payment for moral damage. But in major, it could actually correspond to death. But to ensure that uh, there's no further damage is made and reconciliation is achieved, the DATU can explore um, possibilities and uh, some other ways. Okay? Uh, some indemnification. Like, for example, uh, the win-win solution for everyone so that the, the the other party will not grieve otherwise if the solution is not win-win he may be dragged into conflict uh, because if everyone will not be pleased by his decision or suggestion of course uh, there would be a possibility that there will be a redo again there will be a conflicts between both parties so an example of this is among the Subanan we all know that before one of the prevalent issues and problems that they are facing is the elopement elopement okay elopement is actually pun punishable by death so if no that would mediate there will be a violence and the offended owner of the prospective groom and the woman's family would motivate them to kill the eloping couple especially the man who took the bride to be in such a case an imminent danger of attack and counter attack would loom right and the dato must therefore inter intervene to ensure the community would continue to live in tranquility And the Datu must therefore intervene to ensure, as I have said, the, the Datu has to intervene to ensure the uh, community, the, the community's tranquility. So, the mediating Datu would need to exert his effort to find the eloping couple and bring them to justice. This act of elopement is actually punishable by death. But, to control the damage, the Datu could always argue that the death would do no good to anyone in the community. Therefore, Datu has to be very persuasive and convincing to convince the offended party. He may suggest uh, that instead of death, the offended party uh, could uh, may uh, they may demand for payment of moral damage or anything in that way uh, the offended party could uh, could use the money to look for another woman who would be uh, willing to be his wife because before it is a uh, really uh, common for them and even up until now the arranged marriage right um in case but for example, uh, in case the offender and his family cannot uh, pay, the Datu himself, okay, the Datu himself would uh, would shoulder the payment. Of course, on a condition that the offender would have to serve the Datu for a certain period of time, depending on uh, the amount of the payment made by the Datu to save him. Oh, uh, additionally, among the Blaan, there is what we call sa Sajandi. This is a ritual after a conflict. Okay. In this uh, ritual, there is a small incision 
made on the left chest of the conflicting individuals. To draw a drop of blood will be mixed in a glass of wine. You will love wine. I don't know if there's a blood there. Is it still yummy? I mean, <laughs> the blood obtained from and the, the blood obtained from uh, from the left chest is symbolic as this section is near the heart, which means sincerity, especially to the Sanjandi participants. So, the conflicting parties should drink with the same glass to justify their agreement that uh, they have become blood blooders, blood blood brothers, and that the conflict is now resolved. That's how unique uh, the, the, the kind of conflict resolution process they they had before. Okay. Uh, w with regards to the land holding system of our natives, uh, historically and anthropologically speaking, there are uh, evidences that suggest that the indigenous land tenure system in the pre Islamic or pre colonial days was characterized by communal ownership. Uh, this term of the Lumad actually meant communal st uh, stewardship. Okay? The general assumption was that the air, the water, and even the land were only interested to them by the real owner, which is the the uh, the, the almighty creator in the sustainer. And the Datu served only as the manager and overseer of the area entrusted on the tribe by of course by the by the almighty creator and sustainer. Um his followers will only uh, serve as a steward of the land, okay, and they will be assigned to be a parcel of lands. They may they may have the right to use the land, but they are not allowed to sell it to other people because they always uh, believe that this land, that the land where they're their foot are their their feet are are uh, are set is considered as sacred. At present, our indigenous peoples are facing common struggles along with the other indigenous peoples all throughout the globe. And the struggles are number one, they struggle in uh, protecting their ancestral lands from being plundered by new settlers and the other interest groups for illegal logging, for mining, or even for the establishment of large factories. The second common struggle is preservation of their culture in this changing world of traditions. We all know that culture is dynamic and it is really hard to preserve our traditional culture. Very sad, but that is the reality. And you know what? Many of them are abused and now become the marginalized sector from the land where the ancestors sat their feet. Some even become informal settlers. So it's it's just timely to inform these people that the government is granting them with certain rights, particularly in the ancestor rights, in, the, in their ancestral domains. Uh, we have to empower them, we have to inform them, and uh, I believe education is one of the best ways to empower them. Because we know that if a person is lacking of knowledge, that person is vulnerable to any abuse and exploitation. 
So let us love, protect our indigenous peoples. That's all for this video. I hope you've learned a lot. Thank you for watching. God bless you.